Okay, um, let's get started. All right, so good evening, everyone. Hopefully, uh, everybody had a um, smooth day at work. In tonight's uh, presentation, Dr. Wam and myself will be talking about the 2020 IADT guidelines for the evaluation and management of traumatic dental injuries. Um, most of us had, uh, if not all, had a look at those uh, uh, at those recommendations, whether it's uh, through the American Association of Pediatric Dentistry or other uh, sources. So we're just going to try to keep it nice and simple. We summarize, summarize it as much as possible. Um, so let's get started. So in principle, dental trauma comprises 5% of all injuries, where 25% of uh, all school children and 33% of adults have experienced trauma to the permanent dentition. Now, this means that it's just relevant in our uh, practice. Um, the guidelines are to be applied with the evaluation of the specific clinical circumstances, uh, clinicians' judgment, and patient characteristics. Now, things just like the probability of compliance, for example, finances and understanding of the immediate and the long-term outcomes of uh, various treatment options versus uh, non-treatment, for example. So all those things should be taken into account. Now, following those guidelines will maximize the chance of favorable outcome, but they cannot guarantee it. Now, in terms of general recommendations, um, precisely trauma to the primary teeth. Now, we have a difficulty examining and treating young children due to fear and lack of cooperation. Um, things like maturity, the ability to cope with emergencies, the time of uh, shedding of the injured tooth, and also the occlusion are all important factors that influence the treatment. Uh, we have to uh, keep in mind a couple of things, uh, like um, multiple traumatic episodes are common in children and that may affect the outcome following trauma, as well as the damage to the permanent tooth germ. So we've all seen Turner syndrome uh, at one point. Things like impaction, eruption, disturbances are some of the consequences. Now, when thinking immature versus mature permanent teeth, we want to preserve the pulp in immature permanent teeth uh, as much as possible. This will help ensure continued root development. Um, the loss of permanent tooth for a child or a young teenager has a lifetime consequences. So losing the central incisor at age 11 versus a few decades later um, can have, uh, can have uh, certain effects on, uh, on the child. Um, immature permanent teeth have considerable capacity for healing after traumatic pulp exposure, yeah. luxation injury or root fracture. This is something that we're going to expand on, Dr. Wam and myself. So this is something that Dr. Ram was going to be talking about, the avulsion of permanent teeth. So the prognosis is heavily dependent on actions taken at the place of the incident. Uh, treatment options and prognosis also depend on the viability of the PDL and the maturity of the root. So it would be a good time to kind of touch up of, um, on the sequencing of the management. Um, so the management usually begins at the time of the injury. So the office receives a call. Um, it would be a good idea to obtain a history of the accident. So where, how, when it happened. Um, a brief medical history uh, for the person who's traumatized. So we want to also get like which tooth is it approximately? Is it top, is it bottom, back, front? Um, we want to ask them that if it's evolved, we want to insert it in the socket. We want to keep it in the mouth or milk. And Dr. again, Dr. Ram is gonna talk about this uh, more. Um, we wanna make sure that they handle it by the crown and rinse the debris if needed, but not clean the tooth. Uh, we don't wanna damage the PDL again. <clears throat> Excuse me, so when I also ask if there's other trauma, so is there amnesia, for example, immediately after, in which case we would refer to the hospital because we would be suspecting uh, concussion in that case. Anyways, moving on. So in terms of uh, patient or parents instructions, we want to make sure that we educate the parents and children um, 
about those uh, traumas and uh, the immediate management in case something happens. Um, patient compliance with follow-up appointments and home care contribute to better healing following injury. Now, in terms of antimicrobial rinses, so for adults, usually uh, chlorhexidine is, is the preferred uh, rinse for one to two weeks, and you want to be mindful of the staining part. And in terms of children, we want to do a direct application to the affected area with a cotton swab. So the follow-up regimens in terms of uh, in terms of primary teeth, I'm not gonna read all those. It's just what's to note is that things like enamel fracture uh, or enamel dentin fracture, we're following up for after eight weeks. But something like a root fracture, we have a more kind of prolonged follow-up uh, protocol uh, in that in that sense. So generic and injury specific outcomes, those are things that we are uh, looking out for during the follow-up appointments. Uh, things like periodontal healing, whether it's the bone, uh, bone loss, recession mobility, or the ankylosis, or any resorption, pulp healing, pain, discoloration, tooth loss, quality of life. Um, quality of life is more like uh, time of work, time of school, uh, time of sports, for example. We wanna be looking out for the aesthetics um, related anxiety as in related to the trauma, the number of clinical visits and the impact on uh, the successor as in the succeeding tooth. Um, those are the generic things that we're looking for now in terms of specific outcomes or injury specific outcomes. We're looking for the quality or loss of the restoration or the realignment in case of uh, root fracture. I'll go back one more slide. And those are the things that we are kind of talking about right now. So enamel fracture, enamel dental fracture, crown uh, fracture, crown root fracture, root fracture on its own, and alveolar fracture. Now moving on to uh, injuries like concussion, subluxation, extrusion, lateral luxation, and intrusion, the last two being the uh, worst in terms of uh, uh, or not worse, uh, unfavorable outcome, those are the most uh, um, dangerous uh, traumas. Uh, hence, we see a longer um, follow-up period for those injuries. Similarly, we're looking at similar uh, genetic outcomes uh, in the follow-up sessions. Um, in terms of the injury-specific outcomes, we are mainly looking at the realignment, the realignment sorry, where spontaneous repositioning has been undertaken. Now, in terms of uh, bulging of a primary tooth, we are looking at uh, a one week, eight week, and a six year old follow up. Now, um, the main thing that we are uh, looking out for in terms of outcome is the impact on the on the development succession, uh, on the development of the successor. When we start talking about permanent teeth, however, we start having a more kind of even prolonged uh, follow up period. Um, something to note here is that we are taking radiographs at every uh, single follow-up visit, um, whereas in primary teeth, uh, they are kind of, uh, or they are recommended to be taken at, at certain uh, uh, intervals. Similar outcomes um, are going to be looked out for uh, during the follow-up sessions. And again, uh, I'm not. I'm not going to go through all those. Um, those are those are in there on the on the documents. But again, when we start talking about the more complicated um, injuries, like avulsion, for example, versus a concussion, we we can clearly see that we are kind of um, bringing the patient back in more frequently and for a longer period of time. So talking about splinting, um, it's, a, it's a nice little uh, table in the, in the documents there that kind of summarizes the, the splint type and duration. So for primary teeth, we splint alveolar fracture for four weeks, lateral luxation and uh, root fractures, we splint for four weeks if required, as in if it's, they are hypermobile. And we're gonna look at that later as well. In terms of permanent teeth, 
So subluxation, if need be, um, it's going to be a two-week splint. In terms of extrusion, it's going to be a two-week splint. Lateral luxation is going to be four weeks. Intrusion is going to be four weeks. Avulsion is going to be two weeks. So and root fracture in the apical to mid-third is going to be four weeks. In the cervical third, however, it's going to be four months. Now, alveolar fracture, we're going to be splinting for four weeks. So they recommend that the splint uh, type is uh, a short-term splint, uh, passive and flexible splints are recommended um, for splinting luxated doubles and root fractured teeth. Now, in case of alveolar bone fracture, splinting teeth can be used to immobilize the bone segment. Stainless steel wire up to 0.4 millimeter diameter is recommended. So we're going to talk about fractures and luxations. I want to say that the trauma can result in fracture and displacement of teeth, in addition to things like crushing bone and um, soft tissue injuries, like contusions or bruises, abrasions, and lacerations. Now, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that a combination of two different types of injury to the same tooth will be more detrimental than a single one, creating a negative synergistic effect. Now, radiographic Im Im examinations, um, they recommend that uh, essentially uh, the clinician's kind of uh, evaluation uh, or input be, be in, in this case. Uh, they recommend several two-dimensional projections and angulations. Um, initial radiographs are important for providing a baseline for comparison of the future um, follow-ups. Uh, film hoard holders or uh, rim holders are recommended for standardizing the angulations. Um, CBCT, they provide enhanced visu visualization, particularly in cases like root fractures, and they help determine the location, extent, direction of the fracture. Now, when deciding whether 2D or 3D, um, the idea is that will this, will moving to a 3D imaging um, change the management of the injury? Now, which is, I thought is very nice that they do recommend the photographic documentation of the potential and follow-up examinations and mainly for medical legal importance. Um, they also help us um, soft tissue, uh, determine soft tissue healing, pardon the typo there, discoloration, re-eruption or uh, infraposition of teeth. They talk about sensi sensibility and vitality so the sensibility test is the EPT and the cold. They recommend it as soon as it's practical to do so to establish a baseline um, and uh, to be repeated at follow-ups um, versus having to wait uh, four weeks before uh, initiating any kind of sensibility test. Um, even though they uh, say it might be unreliable due to the transient lack of neural response or permanent lack for that matter. In terms of vitality, they recommend the use of pulse oximetry um, to measure the blood flow to the tooth. However, uh, there isn't, uh, there isn't um, a device uh, designed for teeth. So I guess that's, uh, that's to be disregarded. Now, endodontic considerations. So for mature teeth with a closed apex and um, usually recommend uh, early end treatment um, for the teeth that have been intruded, severely extruded or laterally luxated. They recommend the use of calcium hydroxide uh, for one to two weeks after the trauma, up to one month, followed by the obturation. Now the corticosteroid antibiotic paste can be applied uh, as an anti-resorptive uh, medication. Yeah, it's placed ASAP and left for at least six weeks. Um, in immature teeth with an open apex, healing or uh, revascularization uh, potential uh, for those teeth, we want to avoid uh, root canal treatment unless clinical or radiographic evidence of necrosis or periapical infection. Um, now, it's good to note that resorption is rapid in children, so we have to make sure that those patients are the ones that uh, are going to come to the follow-up appointments. 
in term in terms of external resorption um, where there's evidence of that throat canal treatment should be initiated immediately and the canal should be medicated with calcium hydroxide and replaced every three months until resorption lesions disappear radiographically at which point final obturation is performed so to the individual um, traumas to the teeth we want to start with the enamel infraction which is an incomplete crack or crazing of the enamel um, usually no need for treatment however if severe we are going to etch and seal with a bonding resin uh, to prevent discoloration or bacterial contamination um, in cases of enamel fracture the fragment should be accounted for that's the main thing now if missing fragment um, with soft tissue injuries radiographs of those soft tissues should be obtained now if the fragment is available it can be bonded alternatively either smoothening the enamel or adding a restoration is recommended um, in terms of uh, being unable to locate the fragment um, if, if they don't know where it is and then we are suspecting inhalation it would be a good idea to refer to physician um, they would be able to kind of listen to their lungs and determine if they need a chest x-ray now talking about enamel dentin fracture again the fragment should be accounted for and again if uh, soft tissue injuries uh, and then accounted for we can take radiographs um, if available and intact we can bond the fragment after rehydration with water or saline for 20 minutes um, we can alternatively uh, place a GIC excuse me place a GIC or a composite resin and if the fracture is within uh, 0.5 millimeters from the pulp calcium hydroxide liner um, covered with GIC is recommended now again if uh, suspected inhalation we refer to the physician now in cases of uh, enamel dental fracture with a pulp exposure or a complicated crown fracture in cases of immature root and open apex now we want to do a partial pulpotomy or pulp capping to promote further root development um, when when able to do so so the partial pulpotomy is the preferred treatment in teeth with complicated with completed root development and we want to bond the fragment if uh, if possible place a composite restoration uh, glass anime restoration or um, crown so in crown root fracture without the pulp exposure the recommendation is um, now before 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 the treatment so this usually involves enamel dentin and cementum and extend below the gingival margin um, usually a positive sensibility test uh, where the uh, where the tooth is still sensitive to cold and responds to uh, the EPT um, it's usually tender to percussion so on the emergency appointment before a treatment plan is finalized one stabilize the loose fragment to either the adjacent tooth or the to the non-mobile fragment um, we want to consider removing the coronal uh, or the mobile fragment and restoring uh, the exposed dentin with again glass anomer cement or uh, composite resin um, long-term treatment options we have the option of orthodontic or surgical extrusion um, orthodontic might also involve uh, some uh, crown lengthening uh, procedure as well uh, root canal in case of infection or necrosis um, root submergence uh, perhaps intentional replantation autotransplantation or extraction even so when there's a uh, pulp exposure in the crown root fracture the initial management is a uh, similar to the uncomplicated crown root fracture where again like we said we want to uh, stabilize the loose fragment and uh, uh, whether to an adjacent tooth or to the non-mobile fragment uh, however the partial pulpotomy should be attempted in immature teeth with open apices 
and uh, root canal treatment is usually indicated for mature teeth. Now, the restoration options are similar to the complicated canal root fractures in terms, of course, of, uh, of the long-term uh, treatment options. When we start talking about root fractures, um, the coronal segment might be, might be mobile and displaced. Uh, tooth is tender to percussion. We have negative sensibility testing, indicating transient or permanent neural damage. The fracture can be at any level of the root, so at this point we're not specifying whether it's cervical, whether it's apical. Um, we want to try to reposition the coronal fragment as soon as possible, and we want to check uh, the correctness radiographically. You know, we want to splint the mobile frag fragment after repositioning, and um, we want to make sure that we do not remove uh, the, cerv the uh, mobile fragments at the emergency visit, uh, cervical fractures do have the potential to heal. So in addition that no root canal uh, treatments to be initiated at the emergency visit either. We wanna monitor the healing and the pulp status for at least one year. Now, necrosis infection may develop later and uh, the, this, uh, this part gets a little bit uh, tricky because, uh, say, usually in the coronal fragment only, so endodontic treatment for the coronal segment only is indicated. And they outline difficulty in located that, uh, that fragment uh, yeah, precisely. So in mature teeth where cervical fracture is above the alveolar crest and the hypermobile fragment, um, the removal of this fragment with the root canal, with the RCT post and core, and the crown might be necessary. Now, further treatments like uh, ortho uh, extrusion, crown lengthening, or even extraction are possible future treatment options. Okay, coming to alveolar fracture. Fracture is complete, and it extends from the buccal to the palatal, in the maxilla, and from the buccal to the lingual and the mandible. Um, the alveolar segment, uh, we, we, we see mobility and mobility of several teeth as well. Occlusal disturbances and misalignment of the fractured segment are often seen. Um, teeth in this segment might not respond to sensibility testing. We want to reposition and stabilize as in splint uh, the segment. We want to suture any gingival lacerations that are present and we want to monitor the condition of all teeth involved initially and at all follow-up appointments to determine if and when endodontal treatment becomes necessary. Moving on to concussion, um, in case of concussion we have normal mobility, slight tenderness to percussion and touch, and they are likely to respond to sensibility testing. Now in concussion cases we want to monitor the pulp condition for at least one year, usually preferably longer. Um, so subluxation in comparison to concussion, it's, uh, it has abnormal mobility, but it's not displaced. Uh, tenderness to touch and light tapping, and the tooth might not respond to pulp sensibility testing initially, indicating transient, transient pulp damage. Um, usually no treatment is needed, uh, according to the IADT. Uh, if excessive mobility or tenderness when biting on the tooth, we can splint for two weeks. We want to monitor the pulp condition for at least one year and preferably longer. In cases of extrusive luxation, the displacement of tooth out of the socket in an axial or uh, incisal direction is seen, mobile and elongated tooth that will unlikely respond to sensibility testing. Uh, when I reposition into socket gently um, under local anesthesia, I want to splint for two weeks as well. Now, if there's fracture of the marginal bone, we want to splint for an additional four weeks. Again, we want to monitor the pulp condition, and in case of necrosis or infection, we want to initiate the appropriate endodontic treatment, uh, depending on stage of root development, like uh, apexification, for example, for open APCs. Um, or RCT for uh, maturity.
in cases of lateral luxation, now this is one of the, again, uh, one of the traumas with the least favorable outcomes. Um, in, the, on this, in those cases, we see displacement uh, in any lateral direction. Um, usually though it's buccal lingual. It's often associated with a fracture or compression of the alveolar uh, socket wall or facial cortical bone. Now, frequently immobile, um, as those teeth are, or the apex of those uh, teeth is locked uh, in by the bone fracture. Now, percussion will give a high metallic or ankylotic sound. There is likely no response to pulp sensibility testing in, in case of lateral luxation. What you want to do is, again, under local anesthesia, we want to reposition digitally by disengaging from locked position and gently into the original position. Um, the steps are, want to palpate the gingiva to feel the apex of the tooth. want to use one finger to push downwards over the apical end of the tooth, then another finger or thumb to push the tooth back into the socket. So want to splint uh, teeth with lateral luxation for four weeks. However, additional uh, splinting might be required in case of bone fracture. Excuse the typo. Um, monitoring the pulp condition at follow-up appointments and pulp evaluation two weeks post uh, injury. Now we want to establish the pulp uh, kind of um, uh, diagnosis at two weeks post injury. Teeth with incomplete root formation. So spontaneous revascularization may uh, occur if necrosis or inflammatory, inflammatory external resorption occurs. Suitable endodontic procedure should be initiated. Now the teeth with complete root formation, uh, necrosis is likely. Uh, root canal treatment should be started um, using a corticosteroid antibiotic or calcium hydroxide medicament to prevent uh, inflammatory external resorption uh, is the recommendation. Intrusive luxation, and there's a displacement of the tooth in the apical direction. The tooth is usually immobile and an um, ankylotic sound on percussion is heard and likely no response to pulp sensibility testing. So on a radiograph, the periodontal ligament space may not be visible, um, mainly apically. Now in teeth with incomplete root formation, allow for spontaneous repositioning. Now if no re-eruption for four weeks, initiate orthodontic repositioning. We want to monitor the pulp uh, condition. And again, a similar uh, recommendation as lateral luxation. Um, spontaneous revascularization may occur. However, if necrosis infection or resorption is noted, suitable endo treatments should be initiated. Um, now, in teeth with complete root formation, one to allow for spontaneous with an S, repositioning if intruded less than three millimeters. Uh, if not, re-eruption uh, within eight weeks. Reposition surgically and splint for four weeks. Alternatively, reposition orthodontically before ankylosis. If intruded three to seven millimeters, want to reposition surgically, which is the preferred method, or orthodontically. And beyond seven millimeters, uh, surgical approach is required. Pulp necrosis occurs almost always in intrusive luxations. So we want to start the endo treatment uh, two weeks or as soon as the position of the tooth allows. Um, again, we want to use a corticosteroid or antibiotic, um, sorry, corticosteroid, antibiotic, or calcium hydroxide medicament to prevent resorption. And that is it for me. Sorry for the. Uh, <laughs> the topic is interesting as it is, so apologies for the for the lengthy time. I'm gonna leave it to Dr. Riam right now. Can everyone hear me? Sounds good, Liam, we can hear you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, 
Thank you, Dr. Ravi, for that beautiful introduction to the lecture. Uh, I will be discussing two point of topics today. The main point of topics are the evulsion of permanent teeth, and the second topic will be injuries in the primary dentition, and just a quick outline to the treatments. So first we have, sorry. Okay, so first we have the avulsion, and as everyone knows, the avulsion um, is defined as the complete loss of a tooth out of the alveolar bone socket. That usually happens due to trauma, like uh, for example, for kids or adolescents. The most common uh, type of injury is avulsion, and it's the most type of serious because uh, you can easily lose the tooth. Now, the prognosis mainly depends on the steps taken right after the trauma occurs. The main point that we want to stress out, and it's the ideal treatment of choice, is the replantation of the tooth. So first aid would probably be the most important. Now there are um, systemic approaches in regards to treatment planning for the avulsion of a tooth. So first, uh, patients with severe periodontal disease, severe caries, immunocompromised patients, cardiac disease, and patients with severe cognitive impairment uh, because patient compliance is very, very important. The guidelines say that these uh, patients with such things are not to have replantation done, or if they do, they are going to have a very, very low prognosis. Okay. The systemic approaches to treatment. Uh, first, you have to ask if it was a primary tooth. If it's a primary tooth, we do not reimplant it because it could easily damage the uh, permanent tooth bud. And if it's a permanent tooth, then we definitely should try to re-implant it. So the first thing is the first aid. It's known that the best type of treatment is to re-implant the tooth at the site of the injury because the PDL would be very highly viable. So first things first, if we get a call into the office and you know, a mother, anybody, a teacher, anybody lets us know that uh, we do have an avulsion, we have trauma with a child, you have to initially keep the patient calm. You have to notify them that they are to pick up the tooth by the crown, so to avoid touching the root and then they don't damage the PDL. Also to uh, rinse the tooth gently with milk or saline or the patient's saliva if none of that is available and to bring them obviously into the ER and stabilize the tooth with a napkin or anything whatsoever. The main important thing is when the reimplantation cannot occur at the site of trauma, there has to be a transport or storage medium and it has to be less than 60 minutes or else the PDL is most likely not going to survive. We try to avoid the dehydration of the root surface. That's the main reason. Uh, going from most to least, it stated that milk would be the best and obviously HBSS and then saliva, saline and water. Uh, now water is not considered to be the best option whatsoever, but again, if uh, trauma occurs and you don't have anything else, it's better to keep the tooth hydrated than to actually air dry it for over 60 minutes. There are two types of uh, reimplantations that we are going to talk about that are really, really similar to each other. It's uh, permanent teeth with closed apex versus open apex. Now, the closed apex reimplantation can occur in two sites. So if it's immediate at the site, we are going to clean the site of the injury with water, saline, and chlorhexidine. We are going to verify the correct position to clinically once they come. If it is mouth position, we can only apply digital pressure and we cannot avoid, uh, we need to actually avoid applying excessive pressure. The choice of local anesthetic would be um, no vasoconstrictor because it, it there's it, set, it stated that there was some studies that actually proved that the healing would, um, would be affected. 
And also, so if you have two types of uh, avulsions, if you don't have any alveolar bone fracture, then you can splint it with flexible splint for two weeks and uh, four weeks rigid splint if there is alveolar bone fracture. So as for the closed apex replantation, less than 60 minutes and greater than 60 minutes. So the less than 60 minutes, if it's replanted within that time, you actually have a higher prognosis of the uh, re reimplantation to succeed compared to 60 minutes. So first, if it's kept in a storage medium, you examine the tooth for debris in place in the storage medium. You examine the patient while the tooth is still in the storage medium to avoid any dehydration. Make sure that you obtain a very, very detail detailed history of how the trauma happened, how long it has occurred for, and what was done right away. So did they place it in a storage medium? Was it not just so you can kind of update them on the prognosis and future treatment plans? Also the local anesthetic choice should not include any vasoconstrictor. You have to irrigate the socket with saline and remove any coagulum that's there to allow the PDL to survive. You have to re-implant the tooth, obviously with digital pressure as I previously explained, no excessive force and the splinting for any evolved tooth is gonna to be almost the same. If there's alveolar bone fracture, it's four weeks rigid splint, if not two weeks flexible split. Also, you are to place the splint towards the labial side. Um, that's just because if you want, if you have to do root canal treatments in the future, and then also the occlusal interferences are not um, there. Also the composite, that we use or the bonding agent, whichever you decide, mostly composite, you do have to keep it away from the gums just to avoid any secondary infections that can occur from the gums if the patient is not cleaning it properly. So we always knew that prior to 60 minutes, you have to re-implant it. Why are we not, why are we implanting it after 60 minutes? So the main objective to them that they had stated, which kind of made sense, was that you have to restore the patient's aesthetics function and also preserve the alveolar bone level height and contour, just so you're able to have better future treatments. Um, and also you need to know or inform actually the patient that there's a high incidence of root resorption and ankylosis if it has been more than 60 minutes. So a little overview of avulsion because we are almost done. The protocol of treatment that we had just explained, open versus closed, the splinting, uh, you are to suture any gingival lacerations. You are supposed to initiate root canal treatment within the two weeks after reimplantation if necessary. So if you see any signs of necrosis at the uh, follow-up appointments, you are supposed to initiate the root canal treatment. You are going to prescribe systemic antibiotics and check for tetanus status and give the post-op instructions. Patient compliance is extremely important. The uh, parents' compliance is very, very important also, and also the follow-up appointments. Patients need to show up, so you kind of have to explain how important that is to them. So as for open apex reimplanting and immature teeth in children, there's just a little bit of points that I wanted to stress on that short and immature teeth may require a longer uh, splinting time. The main goal, again, just like Dr. Ravi said, was the pulp prevascularization so the root can further develop. If the resorption occurs, it will occur really, really quick in children. So when that revascularization doesn't occur, you have to initiate apexification or revitalize the pulp or root canal treatment as soon as you indicate that there was pulp necrosis or an infection, discolored tooth, any of the signs that we usually see clinically. The antibiotics of choice, the first choice, and I think everybody knows is amoxicillin. You obviously have to prescribe it if it's a child within the patient's weight, age. Um, this one is best because it's very effective in the oral flora and it has a little, very less side effects compared to other antibiotics. If the patient has an allergy to penicillin or cannot take penicillin for any reason whatsoever, then you are going to give obviously alternative antibiotics. Now, doxycycline is considered um, an excellent choice of antibiotic, but the main issue is 
patients that are less than 12 years of age, they are not to be described, uh, prescribed uh, any tetracyclines because of the risk of discoloration to the permanent teeth. Now, the traumatic injuries to the primary dentition, and that's the second topic that we're gonna be discussing. Um, it does have a little bit, so Dr. Ravi kind of explained a little bit of the permanent dentition. It's kindly, mainly the same concept. There's just a tiny bit of differences. So we wanted just to elaborate on that. So first you have the enamel fractures, any, you have to remove any sharp edges. Um, you have to educate the patients as in to be careful when they're eating or encourage the gingival healing if there's a plaque accumulation and um, just kind of really educate patients because that's gonna be the role. The enamel and dentine fractures that involve enamel and dentine and the pulp is not exposed. You have to cover all exposed dentine, obviously with glass ionum or composite. I think a lot of us use composite. So you practically just have to restore the tooth to what it was before. Complicated crown fracture, that's identified as the fracture that involves enamel and dentine, plus the pulp is exposed. So when the pulp is exposed, you have to preserve the pulp for primary teeth with partial pulpotomy. Now, obviously local anesthetic is going to be required and calcium hydroxide paste should be applied over the pulp. Um, and we have to cover this with composite resin. Cervical pulpotomy is indicated for teeth with larger pulp exposures. Primary teeth, now we're gonna be talking about crown root fractures. Um, crown root fractures, mainly there's no treatment. Um, that's the most appropriate thing at an emergency situation when the patient first walks in, but you do have to give um, a very quick referral to a child, a child oriented team. So like a pediatrician or someone that knows how to deal with them really well. If the treatment or the patient is uh, the patient's uh, parent is very adamant about having treatment done on that day, then obviously local anesthetic is going to be required. You have to remove any loose fragments and you have to kind of see if the crown can be restored or not. If it's restorable and there's no pulp exposed, then you have to cover the exposed dentine with glass ionomer. If it's restorable but the pulp is exposed, then obviously we're going to do pulpotomy. If it's unrestorable, then you do have to remove all the loose fragments and then reassess, or you have to remove the whole tooth, depending on what the x-ray and what the situation shows. Um, treatment, obviously, I think one of the main things that limits us with children is the child's maturity and the ability for them to tolerate. So you kind of have to gauge from one patient to another. So as for root fractures in primary teeth, it depends on the location, mobility, and occlusal inter interferences, the treatment options are if it's a coronal fragment and it's not displaced, there's no treatment required. If the coronal fragment is displaced, then you have to leave the coronal fragment to spontaneously reposition, even if there is slight occlusal interferences. If the coronal fragment is excessively mobile, then you have two options that are available. Option one is extract only the loose fragment. Um, and then you have to let the apical fragment, so the one that's uh, embedded in bone, to kind of uh, resorb on its own because it is just a primary tooth. And then gently reposition the loose coronal fragment if the fragment is unstable in its new position. And we can splint it for four weeks with a flexible splint to the adjacent and uninjured teeth. Alveolar fractures. So when the fracture involves the alveolar bone, regardless of whether it's labial and palatal lingual, um, it can extend to adjacent bone too. We kind of have to be very, very cautious in assessing the mobility and dislocation of the segment um, and see if, is it one tooth or more than one tooth? One of the main things that I find clinically is we always jump 
to actually just listen to the parents. So if they say, no, he hit that tooth, we're going to be mainly focusing on what the parents say. But I definitely suggest that we do an overall assessment of all the teeth because you can never know. We can have more than one type of trauma during one incident. Um, and also occlusal interferences is usually present. You have to reposition the tooth and then stabilize it with a flexible splint for four weeks if it's mobile. So in primary teeth, when subluxation occurs, it's usually tender to touch and it has an increased mobility, but it has not moved out of its place. So when that happens, you allow the tooth to heal on its own. There's no treatment, you only observe extrusive luxation, partial displacement of the tooth out of its socket. The tooth appears elongated and can be excessively mobile. The treatment options, um, they're going to be based on the degree of the displacement and the mobility interferences. So we're going to assess the interferences with occlusion, the root formation, and the ability of the chylate to tolerate the emergency situation. If the tooth is interfering with the occlusion, you have to let the tooth spontaneously reposition itself. If the tooth is excessively mobile and ex it's extruded more than three millimeters, then you have to extract it under local anesthesia because we don't want to damage the permanent tooth. The lateral luxation, the tooth is usually displayed. So imagine it as palatal and lingual or palatal labial direction. The tooth is going to be a little bit mobile, but we're not going to be really seeing it on the x-ray. So it's more of a clinical judgment. Two options, they're going to, you're going to either extract, especially when the tooth is very, very mobile, you don't want the patient to ingest it or choke on it. Option two is you're going to gently reposition the tooth and then use a four week splint, flexible splint. So in regards to concussion, the tooth is tender to touch, but it has not been displaced. You only, you don't need any treatment. You only bring them back in for follow-up recalls and observe. For primary teeth that have intrusive luxation, the tooth is usually displaced through the labial bone palate and it can impinge on the permanent tooth bud. And that's where it becomes worrisome to us. If the tooth is intruded to a point where it has completely disappeared, then it can be palpated labially. The treatment option should allow, we have to allow spontaneous repositioning regardless of its displacement direction. Uh, the spontaneous improvement in the position of the intruded tooth usually occurs from six months. So ideally it's going to reposition itself within six months, but it can in some children be up to one year. And I think I'm done. Do we have any questions? Thank you guys, eh? I'm sorry if I started a little bit later, but it was just a very nice uh, presentation. Does anybody have any questions at all? I mean, I'm going to have a question to the group. I'm going to say, how many of us have seen any trauma like this while working? I mean, I want to, I want to get to know the relevance of, of the topic that we have discussed today. Uh, how many of us have uh, seen a trauma like this? Maybe if you can guys message us, maybe we can have a, a little bit of an interesting discussion of, of the way that it was handled. Hello guys. Hi, Dr. Hassan. Um, if I might interrupt just a little bit and uh, probably yeah. that wasn't really covered in, uh, um, in the guidelines is uh, regarding uh, violence, for example. So suspected violence. So a child comes, the, 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 
the parent says that, uh, well, my son or my daughter had their uh, tooth against the table and, and you see like signs of bruising and uh, a very scared child. And you start thinking that uh, it's either a very aggressive table or that there is something more going on. And um, unfortunately I did have uh, one of those cases come by and it's always um, uh, good to, if you don't wanna contact the uh, child services, you can always contact the practice advisory if you are kind of in doubt of, of how to proceed in that in that regard. Uh, however, to answer your question in general, like I have seen it quite a few times in practice, whether it's adult uh, uh, trauma or uh, pedo. Um, so you, you've had you've had what type in. If we're going to say up for adult adult uh, trauma, uh, uh, what uh, uh, did you? Uh, what was what was the most common one that you've seen? Have you seen avulsion? Have you seen uh, lateral uh, luxation? Uh, what type of uh, trauma did you see? So the the there's a, one patient who came in with an avulsion of uh, of the two one and uh, uh, luxation or uh, or subluxation of the one one. Uh, in the same patient uh, following a biking accident. Uh, he digitally inserted the tooth in the socket and then essentially you go back to those charts and uh, and we presented him with the options and he's still under follow-up right now. And did you, uh, what was the vitality of the teeth? This is what I'm curious to know. So the teeth, we did the, the sensibility testing uh, at, the, at the initial visit and uh, it was negative. And I saw him one week after and there was, uh, there, there was a positive response. Uh, the teeth at the time were splinted already and uh, um, the positive response was normal. Um, I think now he is two or three months uh, post uh, injury, and there's only slight mobility on the on the tooth that is actually subluxated, not the one that is uh, avulsed. Yeah, and in, in in the era when everybody worries about radiation, I mean, does does the, does the papers have any recommendation about the frequency of taking radiographs? So, in terms of permanent uh, permanent. Uh, teeth and uh, trauma to permanent teeth, the recommendation is to take a radiograph at every single uh, follow-up appointment. And they have specified the, the follow-up regimens. Um, however, for pedo, it is at uh, certain intervals where uh, radiographs are obtained. And it, it doesn't, it doesn't really, what type, does it really matter what type of an injury or anything like that, right? So no. No, it's for all for all uh, permanent uh, teeth, and no matter what the injury is. Of course, if you have a, if you have a, for example, a crazing, um, there's only one follow-up appointment. Uh, sorry, if you have an enamel fracture, there's only one follow-up appointment where you t take a radiograph then. But uh, no, it doesn't matter what type of injury it is. You take a radiograph at every single appointment. Now, um, I, I know, excuse my ignorance, because I wasn't there from the beginning. I just want to make sure that I did not miss it. But has anybody elaborated on how you're going to splint uh, at all? Or just because I've seen the word splint, splint, splint mentioned, but the actual technical way of splinting, has it ever been mentioned at all? Uh, Dr. Ram mentioned a little bit uh, about the splint where it's buccal versus lingual, um, the use of composite. Uh, we've mentioned at the beginning that it's uh, the splint is usual. The recommendation is a, um, up to 0.4 millimeter diameter of stainless steel wire uh, that is fastened with composite on the teeth. Um, however, the, the, the document does not specify like how long, uh, as in how many teeth uh, uh, the splint is kind of... Uh, uh, extending uh, on and things like that, but they do specify that it's a it's a flexible uh, splint. It has to be passive, passive splint. Yes, right. Uh, it has to be yes. passive splint, right? Passive, yeah. flexible. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thank you, thank you, Rabia. Always thank golden, you. man. Always golden. Always golden. Uh, any other questions, guys? At all? I mean, Dr. Fatima, I know that she had a case. I don't know if she's with us or not. Who? Mm -hmm. Dr. Fatima.
I don't know if she is actually with us or not, but I know for a fact that we had a case in Central Parkway the other day, only about uh, two or three days ago, uh, uh, two three weeks ago, as a matter of fact. And uh, you know. Yeah, she's cool. she's not here. Oh, she's not here. Okay, so sorry, sorry about that. Uh, anybody else want to add anything? I guess nobody wants to add anything because everybody knows how to treat it, which is the point, which is a great thing. It was a very nice presentation, both of you, Yam and, uh, and Rabia. You know, you're, you're always great, as always. Uh, uh, guys, just want to take your feedback. What, what would be a, a more interesting topic if you can put it in the, in the chat so we can discuss next time? got so far one suggestion of uh, internal and external resorption management. Okay, I have, I have, I have multiple requests. So how about if we discuss something to do uh, with um, Periodontology. I mean, we haven't discussed anything to do with uh, periodontal disease, management of periodontal disease, stages of periodontal disease. There has been out there new classification of periodontal disease. Uh, so I don't know. Um, would you think that this is something that everyone might be interested to? Okay, I have another request about troubleshootings with crowns. Okay, guys, say something, otherwise I'll decide. I don't want it to be a dictatorship. Okay. It's a tough room, Dr. Hassan. I know, they're all quiet. Okay, so here's how it is. It is going to be as follows. So in the next two weeks, we are going to have a discussion about periodontal disease, um, new classification, staging, management of periodontal disease. Um, and uh, we're going to get Dr. Salam to uh, do that if she is here. Is Dr. Salam here? Okay, yes, she is. Perfect. So Dr. Salam, you're gonna be presenting after two weeks, if it's possible with you, obviously, unless if you wanna emigrate to Alaska, like one of the other associates wanted to do and we asked her to uh, 
you know, to do that. Uh, so um, uh, the topic would be, um, you know, periodontal disease, the new classifications, the new staging, the management of periodontal disease. Uh, uh, let's just say conservative versus surgical. What are the advantages? All those topics, if it's possible. And I'll leave the details to you. Following that, there is a huge demand about looting cements and troubleshooting of crowns. And there was as well a request for internal and external resorption. So uh, uh, why, don't we, why don't we do this? After we cover that, we will make the following topic uh, to be prosthodontically related, something to do with cements, looting cements, crown preps, and we'll see if we can get you a guest lecturer this time, like a certified prosthodontist uh, to do that topic for us. So if you can kindly um, uh, message, uh, put, put deep messages on the, uh, uh, on the, um, on the face, uh, uh, on the WhatsApp group uh, of the prosthodontic topics that you would like to, to cover. And we'll see what we can do about that. I think me and Fatima, uh, you know, can, uh, can uh, think of a good candidate to cover that topic uh, for you. Uh, guys, and uh, he, some of you have probably attended it. It's, uh, it's, uh, he is a certified prosthodontist uh, from Halifax. Uh, don't he tell is them, actually don't the head tell of the. Oh, you know, make it in, make it a little bit, uh, yeah, make it it's a little exciting. bit more exciting, exciting, of course, exciting. Now, I, uh, um, uh, I hope that you also. Uh, you know, Fatima winning $10,000 in Family Feud. Have we all done that? Isn't that amazing? She's the richest person right now in the group. You're so funny. <laughs> Anyways, I don't want to keep a lot of people in because it's late and people are tired. They've had a long day at work. Uh, you know, um, uh, so uh, we will talk with everybody. Thank you again for those who have attended. For those who have not attended, Fatima has recorded this and soon we will have uh, uh, a request replay uh, that can as well. So because we understand some people are working and they cannot attend the lecture. Uh, so what will happen is that we will have you guys, uh, you know, attend it and register so you can leave your credentials that you have done it. And then Fatima can issue a certificate for you. Uh, thank the, you. Um, the thank courses you. are are already uploaded onto the Dentistry for Future um, channel. So whatever we've already done is already up. Um, I can send links when, whenever it's requested. And if you subscribe, whenever I upload a video, you will have access. Wonderful. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you again. Have a good night, evening.